In this episode, we talk about the total solar eclipse and how it helps us enhance our understanding of the sun. We also talk about the film The Kerala Story, once again creating controversy in Kerala. But first, we talk about the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. Last week, the Congress party released its manifesto titled Nyay Patra for the upcoming Lok Sabha elections. At a time when it's facing a crisis of confidence and dismal prospects of returning to power, this manifesto offered a range of promises including lifting the 50% cap on quota, cash transfers for women, a legal guarantee to minimum support prices, creation of jobs, and even a law to recognize civil union between couples belonging to the LGBTQIA plus community. But in this manifesto, the grand old party also said that if voted to power, it will put an end to the weaponization of laws, arbitrary searches, seizures and attachments, arbitrary and indiscriminate arrests, and promised to enact a law on bail that will incorporate the principle that bail is the rule, jail is the exception in all criminal laws. This promise was seen as a reference to the actions of the Enforcement Directorate and the Prevention of Money Laundering Act or PMLA, the law that empowers the ED to take coercive action against politicians accused of corruption. Now, while we know that under the current government, there has been a significant increase in ED cases against opposition leaders, it is important to note that some of the most stringent provisions of the PMLA were actually introduced under the previous UPA government. In this segment, we are joined by Indian Express's Apurva Vishwanath to talk about how this law came to be and why it is criticized. Apurva, we understand that the idea behind this act is to prevent money laundering and crimes under it are investigated by the Enforcement Directorate. Could you talk about the kind of powers it gives to the ED? So, Shashank, before we talk about the kind of powers the ED has, there is a distinct and fundamental feature of the Enforcement Directorate that is distinct from the ordinary criminal law that we know of, which is statements made before the enforcement directorate will be used against you or can be used against you in a court of law. Basically, right now, if you say, uh, if you give a statement to the police, that has to be again substantiated by your statement before a magistrate. To the police, whatever you say, that can't be held up in a court of law that the police only can use for further investigation. Right, the reason they do that is so the police doesn't take a forced confession out of someone. Yes, there can't be coercion in getting your statement, which can happen while you're under the custody of the police. But when you do it before a magistrate, the idea is that the magistrate as a neutral party will ensure that your statement is free and not under the influence of any force. But before the ED, that changes. And the ED also, when it summons you, you may not know whether you're being summoned as an accused or as a witness. Take the Delhi excise scam, right? So under that scam, now if there is a politician of the Amabi party who is called in now, who has so far not been involved in the case at all. So that person will not know whether the ED is looking at them as an accused or as just a witness to whatever happened. Yeah, for example, Kejriwal, when he was rejecting the ED summons, he kept saying that, you know, you should tell me whether I'm being summoned as an accused or a witness. Yes, because this clarity in this makes a lot of difference. Because once you go in as a witness, there are certain things that you may say, which might be incriminating, self-incriminating. But if you don't know that, right, as an accused, you might exercise greater restraint in what you tell the investigative agencies or how you tell them. But if you don't know the difference... And that is later on used against you in court. All of these have a very different effect on how you interact with the system. So the enforcement directorate that way is not quote unquote police, but it has wide police powers. That is in terms of raid, in terms of arrest, in terms of investigation, they have powers like the police, but the safeguards that we have with the police don't exist with the ED. So this is a basic fundamental difference between the enforcement directorate and ordinary criminal law, how we know it. Right. And one of the reasons it is so stringent is because it keeps money laundering at par with terrorism. 
and we've discussed this in the past as well, that the accused in the matter is presumed guilty until proven innocent. Talk about how this law came about. So internationally, this became a subject of discussion in the 90s. And post 9-11, of course, you know, there's been a lot more focus on terror financing. And one of the ways that, you know, you address terror financing is by ensuring that money is not laundered across countries. So which is why you have the Financial Action Ta- Task Force, which is FATF. And there is a certain, you know, list that each country is put on where funds from that country will be monitored and looked at very differently. All of this is, of course, to combat terror financing. But based on those regulations, every country has had to enact certain domestic legislations to facilitate these international treaties, so to speak. So that's where the Prevention of Money Laundering Bill was introduced in 1998. And then that becomes the PMLA Act as we know now. Right. And this was under the Atal Bihari Vajpayee government. But over the years, a number of amendments have been made to this law. And one of the two key amendments that really made this act stringent actually came under the UPA years under Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. And which is especially interesting because out of all the political leaders that have been under the ED scanner lately, almost 95% of them are from the opposition. So yes, the PMLA Act itself was strengthened substantially during the Congress government. But that doesn't mean that there haven't been changes since. In fact, even after 2014, many more offenses have been added to the schedules of the PMLA. And there has been incremental but very crucial changes made to the law even during the current BJP-led government. But one of the key amendments actually is made in 2009 where the schedule is strengthened. When we say schedule, we need to understand how money laundering as an offense works, right? Suppose there is a crime that X has participated in and there are some funds that are generated from committing that crime itself. Say, for example, a dacoity. So that money, how it is then portrayed as clean money, that is the offense of money laundering. So if the ED, say, has to go after that washing of that money, then it has to ensure that dacoity is something within its purview. So every time that offense, which is what we call a scheduled offense, say the dacoity happens, then ED can swoop in and check where the money went, where the money trail leads them to. So those offenses, the predicate offenses are listed in a schedule to the PMLA. And these are called the scheduled offenses. So in 2009, the scheduled offenses were strengthened. A lot more offenses were added to these schedules. So giving ED an opportunity to enter the picture in a lot more instances. One of those was also introduction of criminal conspiracy as an offense itself. So for example, if there are two or more people who are dealing with this money and they are discussing about it, there is certain meeting of minds. In those circumstances, even before the original offense is convicted, proven or whatever, ED can sort of swoop in and look at the money trail. So addition of section 120B, which deals with criminal conspiracy to the scheduled offenses was in a big way giving ED a much wider canvas to act on. Okay, so that was one amendment that was introduced in 2009. Now, the next major amendment comes in 2012, when the Prevention of Corruption Act was added as part of the schedule. And so now, apart from the CBI, corruption also became a remit of the ED. Talk about how that affected the cases under it and the act itself. So one direct consequence of all these offenses being included in the schedule is really that there is a very high bar that is set for bail. Because once you are an accused in an ED case, being granted bail becomes very tough, almost virtually impossible. So even for offenses like corruption, where you usually have politicians, bureaucrats charged with this, the standard for bail really goes up. And this standard for bail also was brought in in the 2012 amendment, where uh, Section 45 is strengthened. So, Shant, like we discussed earlier, where the law, when it comes to enforcement directorate, pretty much appends ordinary criminal law like we understand, right? So, even when it comes to bail, that's what the PMLA Act does. If you look at how the bail provision is drafted, Section 45, which deals with bails, actually begins with a negative statement. It says no person can be granted bail and then goes on to make certain exceptions, which are two exceptions. First, that the person has to prove that there is no prima facie case against them. 
Second, that they are not likely to repeat this offense. Only when a court is satisfied that these two things are proven, then the person can be granted bail. Basically, you can't be granted bail and you have to tell the court that there is no prima facie case against you, which is essentially what the trial is supposed to prove, right? So to get bail, you have to prove your innocence. In a sense, yes. To get bail, you have to tell the court that the ED shouldn't even be charging you for this in the first place. So, which is why, you know, very commonly the rule that we talk of, that is that bail is the norm and jail is the exception, that is turned on its head when it comes to ED. Because here the norm is jail and bail is granted only as an exception. Okay, and then we understand that this bail provision that was introduced in 2012 was struck down by the Supreme Court. But then it was introduced again by the BJP. Talk about how this happened. So, of course, this bail provision that was introduced in 2012 was subsequently struck down as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. This was a two-judge bench headed by Justice Rohinton Nariman. And the court said that, you know, this is too wide and it sort of ties the hands of the court when it comes to grant of bail. And it was struck down. But the BJP government in 2017 through the finance bill, brings back this provision, which is, you know, that money bill that has to be passed during the budget. So it brings back this position and the law on bail continues. One big problem here is that most offenses involving money laundering, despite having such stringent provisions, are punishable to by a maximum of seven years in jail. So the question really becomes that when ED starts investigating and it takes a long time and there is a protracted incarceration period, does the process really become the punishment because the ED investigation sort of doesn't close till the trial happens. And by the time the trial happens, it's anywhere between seven to 10 years. So you probably have spent that much time with the agencies. So that is a central question. And that is sort of what you see play out with many of the leaders today who are in the opposition involved with ED happening. And Apoorva, in July 2022, a three-judge bench headed by Justice A.M. Kanvilkar was hearing more than 200 individuals' petitions challenging the PMLA. But this three-judge bench upheld its constitutional validity. Could you talk about on what basis did the court do that? So all of these issues were, of course, brought before the Supreme Court. A host of these issues are discussed the way ED has these wide powers and the manner in which it exercises it, right? Usually when you have wide powers which can be arbitrary, there is that much scope for its misuse. So when these issues were highlighted before the Supreme Court, and that is those batch of 200 petitions that you refer to, the Supreme Court heard this case and a three-judge bench upheld the constitutional validity of PMLA. So this is the Vijay Madan Lal Chaudhary judgment, which is currently the law of the land. But the Supreme Court in this case, of course, you can question the reasoning. There are a lot of logical inconsistencies with how the court looks at some of these offenses. But the court in totality goes by the government stand on most of these issues. And you can see from the reasoning of the court that the court is really moved by the idea that money laundering is a very, very crucial issue that the state has to tackle. And since it can be done in so many ways that can be aided with technology and and it has larger implications, of course. So for that, you must give the state a bigger hand in how they deal with these issues. And next we talk about the sun. On Monday, the 8th of April, tens of millions of people across parts of the United States, Canada and Mexico experienced a rare celestial event a total solar eclipse. On that day, for a few minutes, whole cities were plunged into darkness as the moon briefly blocked the sun's rays. Now, besides being an awe-inspiring moment for those who were lucky enough to witness it, this moment was also an important one for scientists studying the sun. In this segment, my colleague Niharika Nanda speaks to Indian Express's Anjali Marar about what makes a total solar eclipse so special and how it influences our understanding of the sun. Anjali, can you begin by telling us what a total solar eclipse is and what is so special about it? So, eclipses can happen with both the moon and the sun, that is the lunar or the solar eclipse. And eclipses happen due to the alignment of Earth, moon and the sun. So, in case of a solar eclipse, the moon is positioned in between the Earth and the sun and uh, it is the apparent positions that lead to eclipse. 
And in case of a total solar eclipse, what happens is um, because the moon is positioned between the earth and the sun, it is able to block the sun's light, which we see on the earth. And the blocking happens in such a manner that uh, it appears as if the sun has set or it looks dark for a few moments, and uh, which is why it is called as a total solar eclipse. And um, why it is special is because total solar eclipses, unlike the other types of solar eclipses, occur only, say, once in two years or more. And not all parts of the Earth can witness the total solar eclipse. As we all know, a majority of the Earth is covered by water, and there are several inhabitable places on Earth. So in order to witness total solar eclipse, there are very small areas of geography where this eclipse won't be there. So if you happen to be in that location at that point in time, only then will you be able to witness the total solar eclipse. And in this case, it was the Northern America, Canada and Mexico, where the total solar eclipse, which was visible. Right. So how would you say that a total solar eclipse is different from a regular solar eclipse? And how often does it happen? So total solar eclipse can occur, say, between 18 and 24 months at, at that interval. In general, in, an, in a calendar year, there can be one or two solar eclipses and uh, about, say, six eclipses in all. This can include a lunar also. Partial solar eclipse is more common. And by the word partial, I mean only a part of the sun is where the moon is able to create a shadow of, and you can kind of see a crescent-shaped uh, shadow which is visible onto Earth. Whereas in case of total solar eclipse, the entire sun is hidden, or you know, it's hidden behind the moon. Mind you, it's not that uh, the moon is as big as the sun, it's just the apparent view which is making this uh, whole view in case of an eclipse. So total solar eclipses are uh, fewer in number in compared to the partial or annular solar eclipses. And Anjali, when it comes to research and studies, is an eclipse an obstruction for the scientists, especially those trying to study the sun? So, on the contrary, I would say solar eclipses, or particularly total solar eclipses, are excellent opportunities for physicists, especially solar physicists, to study the sun. So, one can imagine uh, we all wear uh, sun glares when we step out on the sun, it's very bright. And why do we do that is to uh, help us view better. If it's extremely bright, our eyes tend to shrink and we're not able to have a great view. So in a similar manner, total solar eclipse, during the total solar eclipse, the moon, which is occulting or which is blocking the powerful sun rays, gives you a cool feeling. Or if you're viewing through a filter, you're viewing through a telescope, the brightness is just right for the viewing. And uh, it gives you an opportunity to study the outer rim of the sun, or it is called the solar atmosphere around the sun, which we normally look at the sun, it's not possible to witness. It is very faint. So I would say that a total solar eclipse is a perfect occasion for physicists to study the solar atmosphere. And generally, several of them undertake experiments, balloon experiments. They fly certain flights to capture and get observations during the total solar eclipse event. Okay, so talk about the kind of experiments that were done this time around. What all was studied while the eclipse was happening? All right. So, because of the total solar eclipse, there were um, several experiments which were undertaken. For example, it could be done by sending an aircraft with instruments on board which can take observations. Or balloons could be sent and uh, we could witness uh, and take observations. Ground-based observations can be done using telescopes with which are fitted with certain filters. So, there are different kinds of um, experiments and observations which the scientists could undertake and they did do it during the total solar eclipse until a few hours ago. This also included an Indian team from the Aryabhatta Research Institute of Observational Sciences in Nenital. So, multiple kinds of experiments and observations, observation campaigns can be performed during a total solar eclipse. And can you also explain how studying the solar atmosphere during a total solar eclipse is different from studying the sun at any other time? So one can imagine, um, you know, looking at a very bright source or a very bright light in your room. You may not be able to see the fine lines or the fine periphery around that uh, source of light. So similarly, uh, the sun is a very bright source of light. You can't look at it directly and you have to use multiple filters and multiple other apparatuses to, to be able to witness the sun. So in case of total solar eclipse, when moon naturally is blocking the sun, even though it is for a few moments or a few hours, and when you are um, having an apparatus set up for it, 
you're able to see the sun's periphery, sun's immediate atmosphere around the sun, which you would otherwise not see when you're directly looking at the sun. Though there are um, instruments like a coronagraph on on board uh, space missions, even Aditya L1 has a coronagraph. But there are chances that these onboard uh, instruments that they would suffer from scattering of light, and hence the data that you you know obtain may not be of much use. So in this case, total solar eclipse, the moon becomes your natural source of blocking the sun in the, or the source, helping us view or see the those parts of the sun which is otherwise not visible during a non-eclipse period. And Anjali, if we talk about India's solar mission, Aditya L1, was it affected by the total solar eclipse at all? So, um, Aditya N1, uh, which was launched last year and the desired destination, I mean, Aditya's position, it was inserted into a certain position called as Lagrange Point 1 that happened uh, earlier this year. So, because of the total solar eclipse, Aditya's functioning or operations were not uh, affected. This is uh, simply because if I may ask you to imagine four points from your left, starting with the sun, then next to it being the Lagrange point one, then the moon, and lastly, extreme right being the earth. So during the total solar eclipse, the moon's position was behind the Lagrange point, and the moon's shadow was falling on, um, you know, moon was able to cast a shadow on earth. So the typical answer to your question would be that the total solar eclipse did not have any effect on the operations of Aditya, simply because the moon was behind the Lagrange point or the position where Aditya is presently located at Function. And in the end, we talk about the film The Kerala Story. One year after hitting theatres, the film continues to stir controversy within Kerala's political arena. According to a report by Indian Express's Shaju Philip, following the lead of the Iduki diocese, several other Catholic dioceses are now planning to screen the contentious film as a means of educating teenagers about what they perceive as the dangers of love jihad. This development comes after an intense backlash from both the ruling CPIM and the opposition Congress regarding the state-run Doordarshan deciding to air the film just days before the Lok Sabha elections in Kerala. Both parties had lodged complaints with the Election Commission urging for the film's broadcast to be banned. The film portrays the narrative of four Kerala women who convert to Islam and join the Islamic State, with the filmmakers asserting that thousands of women from the state had fallen to this, even though there is no evidence for this claim. The story is, however, based on four women who converted to Islam and travelled with their husbands to Afghanistan to join ISIS between 2016 and 2018. They are currently incarcerated in an Afghanistan prison. And the film uses the story of these four women to paint a larger picture of the alleged Islamic State recruitment in Kerala. On Tuesday, after the decision of the Catholic diocese, Chief Minister Pinarayi Vijayan slammed the film, saying it is against the cultural ethos of the state. While the leader of the opposition, V.D. Satisan, said the movie had nothing to do with reality, adding that Kerala has no such issue and it is a deliberate attempt to denigrate the state. Shaju Philip writes that while the Iduki Dices aired the movie on the 4th of April for students of class 10 and 12, it will be screened later this week in gatherings and family meetings by the Kerala Catholic Youth Movement. According to Philip, now pro-RSS social media groups have urged Hindu groups to take a cue from the Catholic Church and screen the movie as well. The BJP, which is trying to gain a foothold in Kerala and has loved jihad as a pet plank, has praised the church's move. It is key to note that minorities, including Muslims at 27% and Christians at 18%, make up 45% of Kerala's population and are a traditional vote bank of the Congress-led United Democratic Front. You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar and was produced by Niharika Nanda and me, Shashank Bhargav. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.